What's up everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another video. I'm Ryan Beach and on this video today, we are gonna be doing my very first YouTube Q&A episode. This is an episode I've wanted to do for a while because although I enjoy digging into the longer episodes on things that I care about and that I wanna share with you, I also wanna make sure that I'm making space to hear from you and to be able to address things that you all actually wanna hear about for sure. So I opened it up on Instagram and I got some good questions and I thought I would just spend some time going through that and seeing if I can help answer any of those things and uh, provide some value for you guys. Some of the questions that were asked were asked in relation to a call I made for wondering if anybody had any ideas for content. So they're not phrased as a question, but I will still try to interpret them as a question to be able to help answer it. Let's get into the video. So first up, we have a question from Dimitri Raimond. I hope I said that correctly. Sorry if I didn't. Uh, and he says, ways to practice music without the horn on your face. There's really a, just a few ways that I can think of off the top of my head to do this. Number one would be singing. It's a great way to be able to connect what you hear in your head to what's coming out of your instrument, but sort of removing the instrument as a barrier. We don't have to be great singers. I've covered this in a previous video. We don't have to be great singers to get the value out of this. We just need to sort of commit to trying to get better at it. And then also listening uh, is an incredibly valuable way. I'm sure that's not a surprise trying to listen for musical content and then maybe listening to the same recordings over and over and over again so we can dig a little bit deeper than just that sounds nice or I like that. What about it do you like? Are there any things that you can steal from that and implement into your own playing? Uh, Barbara Butler, my teacher at Northwestern at the time would always say, whenever you hear something that you like in somebody else's playing, it's not just because you like it, it's actually that you admire that and you want that. So listening for those kinds of things that you admire and trying to figure out exactly what it is that you like about it can be a really valuable use of your time away from the instrument. All right, moving on. This is a question I got twice from Maury WK that just says trumpet in the orchestra. My assumption is going to be what are some things that are important uh, to focus on as a trumpet player in an orchestra. I would say a few things. Number one, as a principal trumpet especially, I believe my most important contribution is going to be in my rhythm and my time. Just like the timpani player, having something that everybody can grab onto that's consistent and reliable is a main part of the job, at least the way that I interpret it. So always trying to make sure my time is not only great, but consistent. Also, we wanna make sure that our sound is appropriate to playing in an orchestra. So something that's resonant, something that's projecting. I also think articulation is a big part of what we do with our job, making sure we have command over a variety of articulations so that we can have a very resonant and free sound, but be able to make the color distinctions necessary when going from composers to Mozart to Mahler. It's such a wide space in terms of style, and I think articulation is the way that we make those distinctions happen. And then finally, I think just from a preparation standpoint, knowing your parts well enough that you're not so absorbed in what you're doing, but rather you can kind of globally pay attention to what are your other brass colleagues doing or what are the woodwinds and what are the strings doing. Sometimes it can be hard to hear across the ensemble and so it may not be 100% reliable, but knowing your part well enough that you're not totally focused on what you're doing specifically, but rather being able to at least try to listen across to the rest of the ensemble, I think is a pretty important part of playing in an orchestra. This is sort of the chamber music element that makes it so it all works together. Next up, we have Gregory Papas Fritas. It's a great name uh, that just says accuracy and flexibility. I'm assuming that you are interested in how to build accuracy and flexibility as skills. Uh, accuracy is something I've struggled with for a long time. I remember when I was younger, a senior in college, I remember around that time, I felt like I could play the trumpet really well, but I struggled with playing consistently and playing accurately. And part of the reason was it wasn't free. I was sort of trying to control every single note and I would have sort of this hesitation right before I played. And so it wouldn't just be this easy, nice release. So the two problems with that are number one, I'm sort of forcing things to happen, which is never good on the trumpet. And number two, when you're not approaching the release and you're set up the same way, it's hard to figure out where the inconsistencies are. So for me, one of the first ways that I would encourage people to develop more accuracy in their playing is to make their setup more consistent. So the way that you breathe, the way that you release the air, so the way that you time things. I have a video about this, the four steps to a better, bigger, fuller sound or something like that. And this is why I talk about that because simplifying and making your setup more standardized is a way that you can start to have more similarities and more consistency in your approach, which will definitely help your accuracy. 
In terms of flexibility, we wanna just make sure that we have a very consistent and steady stream of air and that the corners are able to support but be loose enough to let the notes go where they need to go. But ultimately, when people, I think, struggle with flexibility, it's because they lose the consistent stream of air. So it's just that balance and we're gradually starting at a tempo where we can instill a good habit and then gradually trying to go a little bit faster while maintaining those good habits. It takes time to build this, so give yourself some time to do it, but showing up trying to push your limits little bit by little bit is gonna be the way to do that. So moving on, we have Trumpet Hannah, and it says, building confidence as a musician. My assumption is, how do we build confidence as a musician? For me, being able to walk into a performance confidently is a function of, I've prepared in such a way that I know every nook and cranny of this piece of music. It's not enough just to play through things. Trust me, I, I did that for a very, very long time, and you can sort of get by, but it doesn't instill a confidence of I know what's happening, I know how to get myself out of a jam, that only comes through deep and focused practice. Building that kind of confidence is a kind of a combination of slow practice and making sure we're testing a little bit and then making sure also that we're leaving enough time to actually learn the piece of music and we're not trying to cram. Cramming can work, it's just not gonna lead you to long-term success. You're gonna have to cram every single time because you didn't give yourself the chance to build those good habits in. So I'd say starting early enough, starting slow enough, and then making sure you leave time to try to perform whatever piece you may be preparing for a performance a bunch of times toward the end so you can build in some repetition for your performances as well. So next up, we have Jake Leroy Van saying insights or preferences on equipment. Um, I have very little advice to give. I'm not an equipment junkie. If you wanna check out a real resource for this, my friend John Kaplan has a YouTube channel called John Talks Trumpet, where he talks all about this kind of stuff, about equipment, he loves talking about it. So I would check that out. You might get some answers there as well. For me, my equipment is a Bach 37 B flat trumpet, a Bach 239 C trumpet. I have a Shilke P54 piccolo. Uh, on my big horns, I play a Carl Hammond custom mouthpiece that's off of a 2MB blank, I think. And then I play a Pickett uh, piccolo trumpet mouthpiece. Like I said, I'm not really into being an equipment junkie, so I have found something that works. What makes it work for me is I can play from the top to the bottom of my register, things are even. I'm not really having to work too hard. I'm not, I'm not trying to find the easiest possible thing. I just want something that's consistent. So for me, if a mouthpiece feels like the upper register is kind of stuffy or the lower register doesn't fit, that might be when I go searching for something that helps make that a little bit more consistent. My boy Conductor Fitz, Kevin Fitzgerald, says switching between horns within a piece. I don't have a lot of experience with this. I've sometimes switched mouthpieces. That's only gonna most likely be for a range related thing. Switching horns in between a piece, you might do this for something like, you know, the high lick in the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Uh, ideally, I would try to have the same mouthpiece so it feels the same, and then obviously you just wanna make sure you practice it. Again, not something I have a ton of experience with, but I would imagine just making sure that you've exposed yourself to that stimulus of what it feels like. It's the same thing with mutes, you know? You put in a mute, and if you don't practice with the mute, it can feel weird, it can feel different, so I think it's, gonna be most beneficial to practice that switch. And then like I said, trying to keep, I think David Hickman's a big fan of having the same rim on all of his mouthpieces so that when he switches horns, it doesn't actually feel different on his face. So hopefully that's useful for you, Kevin. We have just a few more of these questions. Uh, I hope this is fun for you guys. I'm really enjoying doing this. Uh, we have ACU Trumpeter who's actually asked two questions. So the first one is, do longer practice sessions equal more endurance? Uh, yeah, kind of, I mean, if you play for longer, but you rest more, maybe not. But if you kind of try to track how much you're playing and how much you're resting and you have been able to play for longer, then yeah, I think that increased work capacity could translate to more endurance. My friend Chris Smith, who's the principal trumpeter of the San Diego Symphony, he practices in eight minute chunks and four minute rest periods. And then he'll maybe practice for five of those cycles one day and then maybe six the next day or something. And he can see, well, one day I did five and the next day I did six. So that means I was able to play for more. Now, the other caveat to this is we want it to feel about the same. This is what we call rate of perceived exertion. So if you play for 60 minutes one day and you're completely fresh, and then the next day you play for 90 minutes and you're completely shot, that might not be an increase in endurance. So to best answer this question, I would say yes, but only if it feels the same from day to day. And this just takes time to do. I think structure and organization is really helpful to be able to 
um, sort of organize and put everything in the right place so that you can track more easily if you are playing more. But ideally speaking, yeah, if you could play for longer practice sessions, that could translate into being able to observe more endurance in your playing. And the other question ACU Trumpeter asked was, how do you open up your sound? Uh, I went over this exercise in my four steps to a bigger, fuller sound video. One of the things I struggled with a lot when I got into grad school was playing with an open and a free sound. I could play loud, but it sounded like I was punching you in the face when I did it, and it wasn't really uh, pleasing to the, to the senses, I guess. And so what I ended up having to learn to do was to play with more freedom. And so it ended up being less, right? Like I'm not trying so hard to play and rather instead I'm trying to figure out how to sort of balance the resonance, balance the airspeed and all that kind of stuff. So two things that are helpful are one, making sure you're playing in the center of the pitch. And I have an exercise that I can go over at a different time if that's something people are interested in. But we wanna basically make sure that we are not playing sharp and we're not playing flat, we're right in the center of the pitch. This is gonna give us the most resonant sound we can have. And then the other thing is, is to project, to think far away. In that video I talked about sort of thinking of something that's a long way away and then pretending that your sound is starting there. In Barbara's office, she had Lake Michigan that, sh that we could see from her office, it was amazing. And so I would look all the way at the horizon and then I would think to myself, I'm hearing my sound, my articulation there first and then I'm hearing as it comes back. So instead of on the bell, all the way over there. And it, it took some time for my chops to get used to that, especially because I was constantly playing things that were too hard, so I didn't really have a chance to build uh, some, some success into the process, but that's kind of something that helped me develop more freedom in my playing. And the last question we have here is from Carson Merritt that says, best advice for freshman undergrads? I love this question. I wanted to finish up with this one because I feel like uh, I will just speak as if it were speaking to myself as a freshman and hopefully it's valuable for everybody else. The best advice I can give someone who is a college freshman, at least, at, at least, the best advice I can give someone who's a college freshman, at least what I think I can give right now, is to just let the process happen. When I was younger, I felt like I was in such a hurry that, that tomorrow was not fast enough for me to learn how to play the trumpet or for me to learn a piece of music. And I think I fooled myself for a very long time into thinking if I just work really, really hard, I will speed this process up and I will get where I'm going faster. But that also meant that I was trying to get somewhere and then everything would be okay. If I just won an orchestra job, my life would be great and it would be fine. And I don't necessarily know, well now I know that that's just not the case. Getting to some arbitrary point in your career does not necessarily make you happy. So I wish when I was younger, I would have realized that this is something I'm gonna be doing for 30 or 40 years. And so I can allow myself to be kind of bad at it at the beginning so I can fumble and I can get better instead of just feeling like I have to pretend that I have it all together right at the beginning. All right, everybody, that's gonna be all for this video. I really enjoyed doing this. I hope it was fun for you to kind of hang with me while I did this. Um, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like down below and subscribe if you wanna see more content like this. We don't necessarily have to wait for another Q&A video to get answers to questions. So if you wanna send me a message on Facebook, Instagram, my website, you can do that too. Or if you wanna sign up for a discovery call where we can just chat for half an hour about whatever you need, I'm here and I would like to make myself available to help. So there'll be links down below to find all those things. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I would love to help if possible. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Always remember, stay strong, be kind to yourself, never stop growing, and we'll see you in the next video.